Before I begin today, let me just thank Pastor Jeff and our leadership team here at Chapel Street for leading us all through what's been a, a strange and difficult season of our church life. So thank you guys. Great job. I want to begin today with a little game. It's been a while. I got this idea from Tom Ward, our uh, student ministries pastor, and the game is called Have You Forgotten? So if you've forgotten any of these things, let's say in the last month or so, just raise your hand right where you are. I'll see you where you are uh, and give yourself a point. Okay, here we go. Have you forgotten where you put your glasses? I've been known to walk around looking for my glasses with my glasses on my head like that. Have you forgotten? your car keys. Give yourself a point if you've done that. Have you forgotten your phone? I've been known to, in fact, just the other day, I was looking for my phone using my phone. Have you forgotten your mask? I hate it when I do that. You get to the grocery store, you, you go and you see somebody's mask, you got to go back out to your car and get your mask. How about forgetting where you parked your car at the store? I've done that too. Have you done the daily double? Have you forgotten your mask, gone back to your car to get your mask and forgot where your car is? Or maybe you've forgotten a special day. Let's say Valentine's Day or maybe an anniversary. If you want to do something really fun, go to the flower section of your local grocery store uh, at about 6 a.m. on Valentine's Day. You'll find a whole bunch of guys uh, walking around looking for flowers, trying not to make eye contact because they forgot. And don't ask me how I know that. But our brains have like 100 billion neurons, and the human brain can do amazing things. We can learn languages. We can learn multiple languages. We can learn to build rocket ships to go into outer space. Yet we forget simple things like where we put our car keys. Now, what causes us to forget? Well, people who study these things say there are two main reasons we forget. That's leaving aside diseases like Alzheimer's or dementia. Two main reasons. First, they call it decay. That is just our ability to remember things uh, fades over time unless we rehearse or revisit that which we're trying to remember. Like a message written in sand, it gets washed away. And sometimes I have a very sandy brain. The other one is interference. This happens when memories are crowded out by competing information like when I meet someone for the first time, I hear their name and I immediately forget it because I'm thinking about what I want to say next. Now today we begin with our, we continue with our series uh, from 2 Peter called Faith That Finishes and Peter's going to be helping us remember some important things. Now remember Peter is writing to first generation followers of Jesus who are scattered all over the ancient Roman Empire. And last week we began by looking at the first part of chapter 1 where Peter says God has given us everything we need for a godly life. And then he says, so make every effort to add to your faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Now today we start in verse 12 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Let me read this for you. Peter writes, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, those seven spiritual qualities that God wants us all to grow in all the time. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, now notice, Peter's reminding them of what they already know, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. I think it's right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own uh, interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now we see three things here, I think. First, a final reminder, and then a personal testimony, and then the confirmation of prophecy. Let's begin with a final reminder. 
So last week when we looked at the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And I used last week the illustration of parents packing up a son or daughter and heading them off to college. And sometimes that looks a little like this. Um, you want them to have all the material resources they need for college life. But today I want to take the example just a little bit further. So you've provided all the stuff that they need, but what will you say to them as you drop them off? What advice would you leave with them? What reminders would you give them? Here are a few to come to my mind. Go to class. Go to class. It's hard to flunk out of college when you go to class. Uh, sit in the front of the class if you can. I learned from my personal experience, it keeps you from falling asleep in class. And also, I think the professors give you about a half a grade better if you sit in the front. Don't get behind. College moves faster, and it's harder to catch up. Get your sleep. I learned this first semester, my freshman year, when I had an 8 a.m. class. Eat well. That means eat pizza no more than about five times a week. And then make good friends, meaning make friends who are good for you. And remember, that we love you no matter what. And remember this, most of all, that Jesus loves you and is always with you. Listen to what Peter says here in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, literally this tent, to stir you up, literally to wake you up, by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter's offering here what we would call a needed reminder. Why does Peter feel compelled to remind? First, we talked about this a minute ago, decay. That is, we just tend to forget over time. Second, because of interference. We are inundated with all kinds of different information. We hear all kinds of different voices. In fact, we're going to see this next week quite clearly when Peter takes on the issue of false teachers because he's become very concerned that these false teachers are cropping up in the church and these young believers are being confused by different teachings. For example, there were those who were beginning to say that the promise of the second coming of Jesus was not really a real thing, that it was sort of a fairy tale. And we can laugh about forgetting our car keys or forgetting why we went into the kitchen. But to forget the promise of Jesus himself is a much more serious matter. So Peter wants to remind them. Reminders are essential to our faith. If we look through the Bible, we see God often repeats his commands. He repeats his covenants. He reminds his people again and again about who he is and what he has done for them. And why does God do this? Because we forget, we drift, uh, we get distracted, we become uh, swayed by things that are easier, by what's more popular, by what everybody else is doing around us. I think of young people when they go off to college. My boys are all done with school, but I think of them when they go off to college. Unless they go to a faith-based university, they will be told from the moment they set foot on campus in a hundred ways that everything they believe is wrong. Not only everything they believe is wrong, but it's foolish. Everything they learn in church growing up is foolish and even dangerous. And they'll tend to forget. I think of someone who maybe hasn't been able to be in church or attend a Bible study through the whole season of COVID. And they've heard all the, the rumblings of our culture, all the rhetoric about social uh, change and, and political issues. And they become distracted and they for, can forget the heart of their faith. We need to be reminded because it's simply human nature to forget. Peter's also off offering us an urgent reminder. Did you notice, as I read that text, that Peter refers to his own impending death three times? He says, as long as I am in this body, he says, since I know that putting off of my body will be soon, and then he says, so after my departure. Now, why does Peter talk like this? I think it goes back to a conversation Peter had with Jesus just days after his denial of Jesus, just days after the resurrection. It's in John chapter 21. Listen to these words. Jesus is speaking. Very truly I tell you, and he's talking to Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands 
and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So Jesus warned Peter some 30 years earlier that he would one day die as a martyr. Peter also knows that the emperor Nero has targeted Christians uh, and that he has probably already executed the apostle Paul. And so he understands very clearly that which we don't like to acknowledge, we don't like to talk about. And that is Peter knows he's going to die. And he's aware that he's going to die very soon. And because of that, he knows his time is running out. And so there's a sense of great urgency to this reminder, to this letter. Now think of it this way. Imagine you're coming to the end of your own earthly life. And you're surrounded by your family, by your children, maybe your grandchildren. What would you most want to tell them? What would you most want to leave behind? Peter's great concern here is a spiritual legacy. And I think that should be our greatest concern as well. And finally, Peter wants to, wants to leave a lasting reminder. Notice in verse 15, he says, And I'll make every effort so that after my departure, when I'm gone, you may be able to recall these things at any time. So Peter's great desire here is to leave a spiritual legacy. Words of spiritual truth and encouragement that lasts far beyond his earthly life. And because he wrote this letter, think about it, we are reading these words nearly 2,000 years later. Peter left a legacy. The second thing we see in this passage is what I would call a personal testimony. Personal testimony. I have a little confession to make. Uh, I have a habit when I go to the grocery store, you know, when you go through the, uh, the checkout line, there's kind of a rack of tabloid magazines right there, and I kind of have a habit of, of reading those as I'm waiting to go through line. And here are a few I found recently. Check out this one. Farmer shoots 23-pound grasshopper. Or how about this one? Vampire cat captured. Now, personally, I find this one somewhat comforting because I believe deep down all cats want to kill you. That's just me. Here's another one. Half alligator, half human found in Florida swamp. One more. World's smartest ape goes to college. I might have gone to school with that guy. But here's a question. How do we know these things are not true? How do you know they're not true? Well, you could say, well, I've never seen that before myself. Um, you could say, I don't know anybody who's ever seen that before. Uh, and they're clearly all stories that have just been made up to entertain. Now, I think we've all seen uh, in recent years a kind of erosion of truth in American culture, where once we trusted our government or we trusted our newspapers or we trusted the evening news to give us the straight truth, now we have doubts about that. I saw a survey recently that asked the question, is there such a thing as absolute truth? Only 28% of Americans responded that yes, there is such a thing as absolute truth. Because the prevailing idea in our culture today is truth is whatever you think it is. You can decide what's true for you and what's not true for you. And I think there was some of this going on in the very first century as well. Listen to what Peter says in verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That word majesty means magnificence or splendor. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter is saying here, we didn't make this up. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. And the word here means fable or fanciful story. Now the ancient pagan world was filled with mythology. Uh, for example, uh, the ancient Greek myth of Prometheus, uh, the guy who, according to mythology, gave fire to humankind, and Zeus was angered by this and punished him by chaining, to, chaining him to a rock and allowing birds to peck out his liver. Now, that's a myth. It's a fable. Uh, it's, there's no eyewitness testimony to that event. Someone made it up. Likewise, uh, there were false teachers rising up in the early church. 
who were saying things about Jesus that were contrary to Jesus' own words about himself and to the teaching of the apostles. We're going to dive into that much more next week. But my question is today, what are the clever myths of our own culture? We don't talk about Prometheus and Zeus, but we do have our own mythology. Here are a few examples. You are your own truth. We hear that a lot. Be your own truth. Speak your truth. All religions are essentially the same. You may hear that one quite often as well. You can have a life without limits. Pay attention to TV commercials about products. A lot of them lean on this. You deserve a life without any limits. Or you deserve to be happy. Or you can have it your way. Peter says, we didn't make this up. Rather, we were eyewitnesses. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. You may recognize here, but he's talking about the transfiguration of Christ. Now, the transfiguration is one of the more unique uh, little stories in the Bible, and you may have forgotten some of the details. So let me read out of the Gospel according to Matthew, this little story that we call the Transfiguration. Matthew writes, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured, the word means transformed, before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, when Peter gets excited, he says some funny things. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So what's going on here in this story? It sounds a little bit like a like an ancient tabloid headline. You know, farmer shoots 23-pound grasshopper. Jesus' face lights up like the sun. Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain. So how do we know this is true? Peter says, we were eyewitnesses. Now, the transfiguration is significant to us, significant to Peter, because it's a confirmation First of all, of who Jesus is, the very Son of God who receives honor and glory from the Father. It's also a revelation of the majesty of Jesus. His face shone like the sun, Peter says. It's also a statement that Jesus is greater than the law or the prophets. Moses is there representing the law. Elijah is there representing the prophets. And the voice says, listen to him, Jesus, who is my son. Now, it's also a kind of preview of the second coming of Christ. Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, the word he uses for coming here is the Greek word parousia, which means appearing or arrival. And in the New Testament, it almost always refers to the promised second coming of Jesus. And if we look ahead to the great book of Revelation, and by the way, this coming summer we're going to be in the book of Revelation for a few weeks. If we look to Revelation 21, we read this. The Apostle John writes, I did not see a temple in the city, speaking of the new heaven and new earth, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives us light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The Lamb is Jesus and the new heaven and new earth, John says, will be illuminated by his majesty and his glory. And this is the source and power of what Peter calls our living hope. And Peter says, we didn't make this stuff up. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. We saw his majesty. We heard the voice of God. This is my son. Listen to him. This is the truth of eyewitness testimony. Now, if we look at 1 John chapter 1, we read, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. 
Both John and Peter, in fact, the entire New Testament reminds us that the gospel is not a fairy tale. It wasn't made up for entertainment. It's not mythology. The gospel is anchored in real time, real history, real places, and real people in personal testimony. So I wonder, what's your story today? What's your faith story? When did you first encounter the majesty of Jesus? When and how did you experience His grace in a personal way? Because if you have placed your faith in Jesus, you have a personal witness. You have a personal testimony. But when you think about it, it's just that. It's personal. It's subjective. And in our culture today, someone would say, hey, wow, good for you. That's your truth, but it's not for me. How do we know that our personal experience of Jesus is the truth? How do we know? Peter now leads us to what I'm calling the confirmation of prophecy. The confirmation of prophecy. A long time ago, um, I had to go to a dentist for a checkup. It had been a lot of years, so I went to my dentist for a checkup. And she did a routine cleaning and then a thorough check of my teeth. And I think I had one cavity or so to be filled, so I felt pretty good about that. But along the way, she said something that surprised me. She said, do you grind your teeth at night? I said, uh, I don't know. Why do you ask? She said, well, under the magnifying glass, I can see uh, dozens and dozens of hairline, tiny cracks in your surface enamel. I said, well, doesn't sound good. What does that mean? She said, well, usually it means a patient is grinding his or her teeth at night, and it means someday your teeth could crack and break. I said, well, what can I do about it? She said, well, I can make a mold, a plastic mold, a night guard, and you can wear that. I said, how much does that cost? She said, about $300. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it for a while. Thanks. About two weeks later, just two weeks later, I was eating popcorn on a Sunday night, bit down, and half of a back molar just fell out of my mouth. It turns out that my dentist was a kind of prophet, and her prophecy was confirmed. She was telling me the truth, and I wear a night guard to this day. Peter says in verse 19, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, this is a little reference, beautiful reference, to the second coming of Jesus. We'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 20, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter is writing to uh, largely Jewish background Christians. They were familiar with prophecy, the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he's reminding them that all these prophets that they were aware of were speaking about Christ. They foretold the Messiah. They foretold, for example, the Messiah would come from the line of David. They foretold that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, that the Messiah would be rejected by his own people, that he would suffer and that he would be the final sacrifice of sin. They predicted that he would then rise from the dead, and that the Messiah will come again in great power and great glory. And those are only a few of the dozens and dozens of prophecies about Jesus that were made in the Old Testament. Well, Peter is saying that the prophets have confirmed that his eyewitness testimony, that his experience at the transfiguration is true, that his personal testimony is confirmed by God's Word. Now, why does this matter so much to Peter? He says, You will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The morning star here is a reference to the planet Venus in the ancient world visible at night just before the dawn. It's a beautiful poetic description of the promise of the second coming of Jesus. The world is dark and broken by sin. That's what the Bible teaches us full of death, but Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. He's the morning star. He's the crucified one. He's the buried one. He's the risen one. He's the one who gives us new birth into new life and living hope. He's the one who promised to come again in all his majesty. So, Peter knows that his own death is near. He knows that his brothers and sisters all over the world are facing hardship from the outside, they're facing false teaching that's confusing them from inside the church. The world is chaotic and dangerous and getting worse. I wonder if that sounds familiar to you. He's writing what will almost certainly be his very last letter. And what does he say? He says, 
remember. Remember who Jesus is. Remember the eyewitness testimony of those who saw and heard. Remember the prophetic word that confirms. And when suffering or hardship come, and he knows they will, he says, remember the majesty of Jesus. And when you're filled with questions or doubt or wonder if what you believe is really true, he says, remember the majesty of Jesus. And when you see the brokenness and darkness of the world all around you and are tempted to lose hope, he says, remember the majesty of Jesus. And finally, when you face one day from now or many years from now, when you face death itself, he says, remember the majesty of Jesus. Because on that day, like Peter, you will see him as he is. Amen. Will you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for Peter's passion to remind those early believers and to remind us of the source and power and hope of our faith. Our world is indeed a dark place. Our world is filled with voices that tell us that what we believe is foolish and outdated. Our world, world is full of half-truths and lies that sound like truth. And we can be confused. So remind us again today, by your word, of your truth. Remind us today of your majesty. And remind us today of our living hope. It's in your name that we pray.